Yo, welcome to Cult Animation. I'm the cult, and here's the animation. On September 13, 1979, on his 42nd birthday, a man named Don Bluth resigned from the Walt Disney Productions studio to establish one of his own, Don Bluth Productions, along with Gary Goldman, John Pomeroy, and nine fellow Disney animators. Before this, Bluth was working full-time as an animator at Disney and worked as a character animator for Robin Hood, an animator for Winnie the Pooh and Tigger 2 and the Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh, a directing animator for the characters of Bernard and Miss Bianca from The Rescuers, a full-on animation director for Pete's Dragon, and then finally on to an actual full-time director for The Small One. The reason Bluth left Disney to start his own studio was due to several creative differences between Bluth and the studio executives, mostly concerning artistic control and the animation training practices. Bluth, as well as all those that followed in his suit in this venture, were passionate about animation and believed in pushing it farther, telling more mature stories, and in general wanted to be able to create stories that weren't constantly being cut apart and messed with of out-of-touch executives. It was a risky move. Many might have even considered Donna's lot to be crazy at the time. After all, who could possibly hope to compete with Disney? But passion is a funny thing. It can blind some men and women from reality, but for others, it gives them the ability to defeat dragons. Don Bluth from this point on would go on to direct several of the greatest animated films of all time, as well as some of the, uh, not as good animated films of all time. And that's what we're here to talk about today, in this retrospective, we're going to be going over the history, as well as ranking each one of Don Bluth's films. And I will of course be giving my own thoughts and feelings as we go along. Since I've made it no secret on my channel that I find Don Bluth to be an extremely inspirational figure, and many of his films are some of my favorite pieces of Western animation, and so I have a lot to say on the matter. So with that being said, sit back, relax, get comfortable, and let's... Get started, shall we? So before we get started on the ranking proper, I do think it's important to bring up some entries that I won't be officially ranking, mainly because they aren't full-length films, and instead shorts and video games. As I stated before, the first thing Don ever directed was The Small One, a Christmas short about a boy who has to sell his beloved donkey because he's getting old and lazy, and his family needs the money. This of course upsets the kid, but what is far more upsetting is that seemingly no one really wants to buy the donkey because again it's old and lazy, but the only person who seems to be interested in buying it from him is the town butcher. It's a very well animated and extremely sweet story that I would rank as one of the higher entries on this list. But again, since it's just a short, I won't be including it. Nor will I be including Banjo the Woodpile Cat, which technically was Don and his team's first independent venture. This was a short made while Don and his team of Disney Rebels were still working at Disney, and in their spare time, in order to test out and prove to themselves that they could create quality animated stories all by themselves. Banjo the Woodpile Cat is again pretty good, it follows Banjo, the little cat who lives on a farm in Pacing, Utah, who is always misbehaving and being mischievous, much to his family's dismay. However, when one of Banjo's stunts nearly gets one of his sisters killed, his father prepares a switch to spank him. Upset and not wanting to face the music, 
Banjo runs away from his home and hitches a ride to Salt Lake City. The short has a lot in common with Don's later films, such as that of An American Tale or The Land Before Time, with a small innocent child lost in a big scary place, and then eventually a big friendly mentor, in this case a big cat named Crazy Legs, comes along to help Banjo out to make his way back home. It's a decent little story, though the ending does feel a little bit rushed as I feel like when he does get home, there should have been more impact. It just kind of gets home, they're all there and they're happy and then it just sort of ends. But for what it is, it's pretty good and has some lovely animation. It is interesting as a sort of prototype for some of Bluth's later films. It's good, just not quite fair to put up against the likes of Bluth's feature length ventures. Finally, what's also worth mentioning is Don Bluth also directed, designed, and produced the video game Dragon's Lair. Dragon's Lair is essentially an interactive animated short film where you try to lead the brave knight Dirk the Daring through the foul wizard Mordok's castle to rescue Princess Daphne from the evil dragon Singe. There was also the less played Dragon's Lair 2, Time Warp. Uh, both of these games feature some stunning animation and some truly magical and imaginative visuals and ideas. There is also the even lesser talked about Space Ace, which is the same concept of moving an analog stick and directing a protagonist through danger, the protagonist this time being Dester or Ace on a mission to stop the villainous Commander Borf, who is trying to shoot the Earth with an Infanto Ray, which would render Earthlings helpless by turning them into infants. Both of these arcade games are super cool, especially for their time through the use of laser disc technology, since, uh, well, they all look like animated films rather than pixels. Again, they are mostly just interactive movies, and I think you can actually get most of the experience by simply watching them uh, in full via YouTube. Maybe as well as watching a death compilation just to see all the humorous ways you can die in the game as well. But again, I don't really think it's fair to compare these two full-length films either, despite the fact that they are very cool and worth mentioning for the fact that Don Bluth and his gang were not only making animated movies, but taking animation to places that they had never been seen before, embracing technology of the time and creating what was a very unique couple of video game experiences. Also on one more note, he was also an animator for the animated sequence in the film Xanadu, which is without a doubt one of the best parts of that movie. It also has an electric-like orchestra song playing in the background of it, so you know that helps quite a bit as well. Alright now, with all that out of the way, let's finally get into the meat of this retrospective and talk about all of Don Bluth's feature films starting with what many consider to be his very best. Some of the uh, production values that you used to see were just not there. You know, they had knocked out contact shadows underneath the characters. They had stopped doing uh, multiple passes through the camera, which gets you just this beautiful magical look on the screen. To say nothing of the stories, which no longer had any bite in them. You know, they were very, very safe stories. What, what are you talking about specifically? For example, what is in Nim uh, that you think is a throwback to the, to the earlier Disney creations? Well, there's several things that I could mention. Um, first of all, I would say story is much different. With The Secret of Nim, we're trying to tell a very definite story that has a little bit of bite in it. It does worry you. The story may scare you just a little bit. Um, it may frighten quite a bit, you know, because it has scenes in it that, uh, that could scare children. Contrary to all the publicity put out on animation, it really is not that hard to draw every frame of the film. What's hard is if you draw one frame and then talk for two hours, and then draw a frame and talk for two more hours. Then it's, then it's expensive. But it's a, it's a medium, animation I'm talking about, is a medium where I believe everyone's life is enriched. What I'm mostly concerned about is that it does not dissipate into Saturday morning animation because I think that uh, that's really not worthy of, of the art form. Released July 2nd of 1982, The Secret of Nim is a cinematic spectacle. The plot follows Miss Brisby, a widowed field mouse who lives in a cinder block with her four children. Their residence is on a farm, that being the Fitzgibbon farm. And there comes a time every year where the plow comes in to start, well, tearing shit up. 
and so she has to move her family out of their home as the plowing time approaches. However, unfortunately her son Timothy has fallen ill with ammonia and will surely die if he is moved and isn't given time to rest. Thus, Miss Brisby must find a way to save her son and family in general, which leads her down a dark journey and path of discovery involving the secret rats of Nim, who are an advanced human-like society that lives underneath the rose bush on the farm. The film is actually based on the novel Miss Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, written by Robert C. O'Brien. Funnily enough, the film's rights to the book were once offered to Walt Disney Productions in 1972, but they were ultimately turned down. However, before Don had eventually left Disney, he had also read the book under the recommendation of artist and story writer Ken Anderson. Don absolutely loved the book and would later show it to Disney animation director Wolfgang Ritherman, who directed all these movies that you see on screen right now. So, uh, yeah, I mean, not to mention that he had been there since the beginning, was an animator for Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, and was the directing animator of countless movies. Guy's no fucking joke when it comes to Disney history. But sadly, he turned down Bluth's offer to make a movie, based on the book saying, quote, We've already got a mouse, Mickey, and we've done a mouse movie, that being the rescuers, unquote. However, when Bluth presented the novel to other staff members, they all loved it, and many of those same enjoyers of the novel would be the ones to join Don in what is referred to as D-Day, D standing for Disney in this case, when they all left to create their passion project. I think part of what made this novel so appealing to Don and the 14 animators who left with him was that the story was both whimsical and dark. It had that perfect range of children's novel story, but with some dark edges that would allow for more depth, texture, and intrigue for a film. Thus, it could truly be a movie that potentially enthralled both young and old audiences. This point is further noted in an article from Cine Fantastique, written on February 1982, before The Secret of Nim was released yet. Quote, We don't want people to think we're making a children's picture, he said. We're not. We are attempting to stimulate on all levels for all ages. Certainly, there will be moments of cutesy pie in The Secret of Nim, but such sentimentality should be effectively counterbalanced by the film's darker tones. The audience will witness, for instance, the captured street rats metamorphosis through drugs into an advanced breed of super rodents. The camera will truck into the molecular structure of the rat's DNA and show the DNA begin to change, culminating in a psychedelic light show. The style of The Secret of Nim will no doubt reflect a strong Disney influence, but Bluth isn't bothered by that comparison. Style was something that was set by Walt, and everyone will always give that to him, said Bluth. He used a semi-realistic form, which allowed audiences to strongly identify with the characters. This is our form in Nim. You create a form all its own by burlesquing a human or animal, unquote. I think this is integral to understanding what makes Don Bluth's best film so stunning. A balance between childlike whimsy, dark and serious, or even scary subject matters and situations, and then finally, the most important part being the emotional heart. The Secret of Nim has all three of these things in perfect balance. On one hand, you have this adventure featuring a mouse accompanied by this goofball crow who is constantly fumbling over his own feet, much to Miss Brisby's irritation. But you also have this world full of danger, a cat that seems more akin to a monster trying to eat them, the farmer's plow that is animated with this gritty, rotoscope style, which both looks great but also emphasizes its danger, and its separation from the cute animals down below. It is quite literally a mechanized instrument of death to them. You have this fantastical society built by rats, full of strange and interesting architecture, a mixture of both advanced and mechanical and magical technology, a society full of technical wizards trying to find their own way in the world. That was all originally created through the hubris and cruel experimentation of mankind. There are characters like the Great Owl, who on one hand is a vicious and powerful hunter who is feared throughout all the farm, but he is also fair and extremely wise and willing to talk and help with any creature that he would otherwise eat. 
Mrs. Jonathan Brisby? Why, yes. Then tying all these ideas together is the story of a mother who is just trying to save her son. Her children are all she lives for, and she is willing to walk through any hell that exists on this farm in order to protect them. She is an unassuming hero, who knows little of the politics, secrets, and strange goings on on the farm, but she's willing to learn and overcome any of it. She's often scared, hesitant, and has no real means of fighting back beyond her quick wit, courage, and love that she has for her children that pulls her through. I also love that Miss Brisby is learning about her dead husband through this journey, Jonathan. She comes to understand that he was a better man or mouse than she could have ever possibly known. He was a hero, a genius, the type of character that everyone else looked up to. Other characters like Nicodemus are not only visually quite interesting and cool, but also add to that mystery of both their worlds as he also provides answer to both Ms. Brisby and the audience about her role in all of this as well as her husband's legacy. I guess you could say I'm a bit of a sucker for stories where someone truly inspirational and wonderful has passed away, and now everyone is mourning them while also trying to keep their legacy alive, and in their own way eventually becomes inspirational figures as well. On the opposite side of this are the villains. And while the true main villain of this story is the enigmatic Nim, who are hoping to find the rats and mice they experimented on and take them back into captivity, and they are conceptually quite scary, especially because they are based on a real-life experiment that's a little bit much to go over in this video at least, they ultimately don't have that much presence in the film besides being a clock ticking, much like the farmer's plow. Now instead, the main villain that's on screen is that of Jenner, who I absolutely loves. I mean, just look at this guy with that big black cape, that sly smile. He's a wicked motherfucker that just screams, I'm the villain. I'm the villain, I'm the villain, I'm the villain in your nightmare. But anyway, when discussing Jenner, I think he brings a new layer of depth to the film's plot and overall themes. See, the rats of Nim have been using the electricity from the farmer's house in order to power their small society, and now Nicodemus and the others want to become independent and not steal from the humans anymore. However, not all the rats agree. Jenner and his confidant, Sullivan, want to stay in the rosebush and believe there is nothing morally wrong with stealing from the humans' electricity. In truth, this is what leads to Nim nearly finding them again, so if they were to follow Jenner's side of the argument, they would all be doomed. But Jenner is truly a rat. He wants to take what he can, when he can, while the others want to build a society based on their own merit, and not off the backs of humans. I suppose in that sense, the other rats of Nim want to be more like humans than rats, while Jenner is much more akin to being that of a rat. Jenner isn't exactly the most complex villain, and by the story's end, he kind of just breaks down in anger and just starts stabbing people because he's really sick of arguing his point at that point. But I can kind of appreciate that. He was never a man who thought too far ahead. He's opportunistic. Again, much like a rat, he takes what he can, when he can. And that's what ultimately makes him ill-fit as a leader and what leads him to his own eventual downfall. And the exact type of worldview and philosophy the rats of Nim learn to go against and thus the film goes against in the same sense. I've learned this much. Take what you can, when you can. Then you've learned nothing. There's also this foreign element throughout the film, that of the spiritual. It can be seen in Nicodemus and his mystical abilities, and the magical amulet given to Miss Brisby from him, which he says will activate when the wearer is courageous something that ultimately is shown in full by the film's finale. This element is never really explained in full, however, but it does have symbolic meaning, and the mystery around it is very much done on purpose, as noted by Gary Goldman. Quote, With regard to the amulet, it is a metaphor for believing oneself. Remember the quote, Courage of the heart is very rare. The stone has the power when it's there. Courage of the heart is very rare. The stone has a power when it's there. 
It helps symbolize her courage and the power of the stone to help rescue her children. A miracle, if you will. God stuff. Granted, it isn't in the original novel, but we felt that it was much more powerful. Nicodemus says it was Jonathan's, but really that's just to get her to accept it. We didn't really think it was necessary to explain it further. Seems like it would eat up too much screen time to tell the history of the amulet, when the story was about an innocent widow mouse, who, through her journey, would find out that she has the courage to rescue her own family. Regarding magic, we really believe the animation calls for some magic, to give it a special, fantastic quality. The stone or amulet is just a method of letting the audience know that Miss Brisby has found the courage of the heart. Magic? Maybe. Spiritual? Yes." Unquote. On that note, the film is full of gorgeous animation, though, small spoiler, that's gonna be a case across all these movies. However, what's important to note is Donna's team, when crafting this film, had a set goal, and that was to return animation to its golden era with a focus on strong characters, story, and experimenting with the medium and using more labor-intensive animation techniques for the sake of the art and the film's look. Among these techniques was rotoscoping, which was used as noted before on the plow. Multiple passes on the camera were also used to achieve transparent shadows, and one of the most interesting visually stunning techniques was the use of backlit animation. This is where animated mats are shot with light shining through colored gels to produce glowing areas for artificial light and fire effects, which you can see here in some of these examples, which I believe creates a truly stunning final result. The use of various color palettes was also implemented, with Mrs. Brisby herself having 46 different lighting situations from day to night, underwater and more dramatic lighting. All these different lighting conditions were taken into account, and thus Miss Brisby has 46 different color palettes. Complementing the film's vivid animation is a grand musical score, full of haunting tracks that evoke mystery and intrigue, epic numbers that express the full emotion and scope of this grand tale, as well as a few more whimsical ones. While I sadly can't show many examples of the tracks here on YouTube without me at least narrating over them, I can assure you that they always hit hard. I especially love the main theme, the track At Your Service, and the one called Moving Day, which connects with the epic finale of the film and builds tensions until we've reached a brutal sword fight by the end of the movie between Jenner and Justin, which might I also add is also very well choreographed and animated. However, the best track by far is The House Raising, which gives me both literal and mental chills every single fucking time I hear it. Music is extremely important when it comes to animation. I mean, it's important anyway, but I think animation in particular truly connects with music because the visuals can be anything you want them to be. It's why animated musicals are objectively better than live action musicals. Don't even try to fight me on that point, by the way. You will ultimately lose. And this track and the iconic moment connected with it, I believe truly is a wonderful showcase of the audio-visual candy that can happen when they're both perfectly in sync. Now, to achieve the film's detailed full animation, while keeping on a tight budget about $6.3 million, the studio strove to keep any waste of time and resources to a minimum. The crew often worked extremely long hours with no immediate financial reward in sight, though they were offered a cut of the film's profits, a practice common for producers, directors, and stars of live-action films, but never before offered to artists on an animated feature. Again, underpinning not only how dedicated and passionate these men and women were, but also that they were willing to break conventions for the sake of creating this art. Gary Goldman recalled working 110-hour weeks during the final six months of production. Around 100 in-house staff worked on the film, with the labor-intensive cell painting farmed out to about 45 people working from home and the producers Bluth, Goldman, and Pomeroy, and the executive producers at Aurora mortgaging their homes collectively for $700,000 to complete the film. Sadly though, the film's distributor, MGM UA Entertainment Co., barely did any promotion for the film, 
leading Aurora to finance the advertising campaign themselves. It also had a fairly limited release, and when all was said and done, it made about $14.7 million in North America. However, when the film came to home media, it sold like crazy, and finally it gained its audience through that at last, becoming a cult classic, and thus ultimately did end up turning quite a profit in the end. This film is a labor of love that I could go on and gush about for a while longer, but I think that you have gotten the idea of just how good it is and the work that went into its creation by now. So where does it rank? Well, it's the first movie that we've talked about today, so thus it is getting the rank of number one by default. But for many fans of Dawn's work, both hardcore and casual, this is a spot it would never be knocked down from, and understandably so. But this is my video. And while this is what many people consider to be Don Bluth's magnum opus, and I pretty much agree with that, is there a film that I might think supplants it, takes its spot in the first place? Well, I suppose we'll have to continue onward to find out, starting with the next film. This holiday season, Universal Pictures brings you a very special motion picture experience. The first animated feature film presented by Steven Spielberg. An American Tale, a Don Bluth film. Released November 21st of 1986, An American Tale is where the story of passionate underdogs takes a dramatic turn. Production began in December of 1984 as a collaboration between Spielberg, Bluth, and Universal, based on a concept by David Kirshner. Originally, the idea was conceived as a television special, but Spielberg felt it had the potential to be a feature film. According to an article by John Cawley on the subject of the film's development, quote, Few animated films have had as much anticipation and studio evolution as Tale. The Blue Studio went from a separate entity that produced animation to part of a major marketing machine, an international artist haven. In the beginning, there was a great deal of excitement and amazement as the old Bluth crew once again united for a major project. NIM 2, as some called it, and they were correct in many ways. Though they did joke about doing another mouse movie, this film could have the same ramifications as NIM. A success or failure would have major consequences on animation. Not since his days at Disney did Don find himself having to work within so many corporate structures. Spielberg had definite ideas on how to make films. Universal had their standard procedures. Neither seemed to understand animation's unique way of doing things. It took time for Spielberg to finally understand that adding a two-minute scene would take dozens of people and months of work. In a 1985 interview, Spielberg discussed his learning process. Before this, I had been a bottomless pit of appreciation for animated films, without knowing what went into making them. At this point, I'm enlightened, but still can't believe it's so complicated." Unquote. In other words, this collaboration had the backing of big names, but ones that would need to come to appreciate the effort and time that went into animation, making it lucky that they had Dawn to lead the path forward. But ultimately, both him and Spielberg had a desire to tell a good story, and not limit themselves, as noted in that same article. Quote, Dawn and Spielberg were continually checking on the script's progress. This early brainstorming session was enjoyed by Dawn. Steven's an interesting animal. He's a lot of fun to work with, because he's a child at heart. In the beginning of the project, we spent a lot of time together in story meetings. I like the creative process with Steven, because he contributes a tremendous number of visual ideas, yet listens to my ideas as well. Dawn went on to state, Steven has not dominated the creative growth of Tail at all. There is an equal share of both of us in the picture. At the beginning, Steven said, I want you to do this picture. Make me something pretty, like you did in Nim. Make it beautiful, unquote. And so, Dong went on to do just that. But with that being said, what is an American tale about? It takes place in 1885 Shotska, Russia, and follows the Mauskowitz, a Russian Jewish family of mice who live with the human family named Mauskowitz, and are having a celebration of Hanukkah where Papa gives his hat to his seven-year-old son, Fivel. Fivel's Papa then tells him about America, that in America there are no cats. In America there are no cats. 
However, as if right on cue, a bunch of Cossacks ride through the village square in an anti-Semitic arson attack, and their cats attack the village mice. Through this, the Mousekowitz's home is destroyed, and thus Fievel and his family must flee their village home in search of a better life. In Hamburg, Germany, the Mousekowitz board a tramp steamer, setting sail for New York City. Again, all the mice believing that there are no cats in America. However, a fierce storm that literally takes on the form of a, this monster made of violent ocean waves attacks their ship. And because Fievel is a curious and rather mischievous mouse, he ends up topside and in the chaos gets thrown overboard, separating him from his family. Luckily still, he does survive it all and does end up in New York City. However, his family believes that he is dead. Well, all except for his older sister, Tanya, who believes he's still alive. So now Fievel must travel through New York and try to find his family again, while avoiding the many dangers of the city, including a group of cats that rule the city because, uh, yeah, turns out there are in fact cats in America. The film is very similar to Banjo the Woodpile Cat, with a child trying to find his way home. But this one has a far stronger story. There is a greater emotional pull here, with Fievel trying his best to find his family Along Fievel's journey, he encounters several residents of the city, from a French pigeon named Henry who sings a song to him about dreams coming true, to Warren T. Rat, a con man who is secretly a cat, who is just very small, who initially sells Fievel to a sweatshop after tricking him, to Tony who ends up saving Fievel from said sweatshop and goes on to act like a bigger brother sort of character to him, showing him the ropes around the city as well as trying to help him find his family. The way New York is depicted is quite beautiful in places and foreboding in others, but overall it's just very, very, very big. You really get a good sense of scale with Fievel just wandering through these giant streets. Same goes for the character designs. I suppose I should have noted that before in The Secret of Nim, but Don Bluth and those close to him always do top-notch character designs, and Fievel being a small mouse in a big city Wearing oversized clothes and a hat to boot is both design-wise quite charming, but symbolically surveys that Fievel has a lot of room to grow and learn as a character, which he very much does throughout the film. I also like the villain Warranty Rat's design, with his golden tooth and fancy yet tattered attire. He's a man, or rather rat or cat, who considers himself of culture. He plays the violin, but badly. He quotes the likes of Shakespeare, but is constantly misquoting him. In truth, he's an illiterate fool who loves LARPing as a man of culture, a true con man to everyone, even himself. And all this comes together through some wonderfully expressive animation. As quoted from the same article from John Cawley on the subject of the animation of the movie, quote, As in the past, Dom preferred to storyboard the entire picture, However, the scope of the work soon got out of hand, and layout man Larry Leaker assisted Don, doing one or two sequences. Generally, Don would make rough sketches that Larry would decipher into actual storyboard panels. It was during Tale that Don and his crew discovered a new device that would become a major part of their future process, a video printer. Using an early low price model, the studio found that they could videotape an action, and then use the printer to print out small, around 4 by 5 inches, black and white thermal images from the tape. By printing every frame of the video, the crew found that they had the exact posing to work from. Some merely used it as a reference, while others enlarged it via photocopying and almost traced the images. The crew used this to assist in numerous scenes, from the slightly tipsy walk of Honest John as seen here, to the firemen fighting a fire. Actual firemen costuming was worn by the art crew. Also utilized was the process of building models and photographing them. The most elaborate model probably built of this sort was the Mouse of Minx. A model was also made for the ship so that the storm and the sea could be handled better." Unquote. Once again, Don and his team used everything that they could for the purpose of working smart and creating the best picture they could. Once again, that balance of whimsy, darkness, and heart is also seen throughout the film, 
The whimsy are the moments where Fievel is exploring the city and meeting many of his colorful characters, mouse and even cat alike. But there is also often monstrous looking cats and general danger and desperation around every corner for Fievel. And the heart perhaps is best showcased in this iconic moment when Fievel and his sister sing a song about finding each other once again. Someday, in the song Somewhere Out There, is a genuinely heartwarming scene and probably the most iconic from the film. And what makes it all the more beautiful is that the child actors who played these characters at the time, Philip Glasser and Amy Green, are actually singing this song here. Songwriters Barry Mann and Cynthia Well collaborated with James Horner on four songs in this film soundtrack with James Horner being the general composer for the movie. While I do think several of the musical numbers are pretty good in the film, Somewhere Out There is, without a doubt, the best piece in the film. Sadly, I've heard a lot of people criticize this part of the movie, since it's clear that both the child voices aren't exactly the best singers in the world. But that's actually part of the point. To me, this number sounds far more authentic and sweet, coming from two siblings hoping to see each other again voice cracks and all, and I really wouldn't have it any other way. In other words, anyone who says otherwise is objectively wrong, has no heart or soul to speak of, and should die in the next seven days in some horrific fashion. An American Tale is a wonderful film, and truly worthy of being considered one of Dom Bluth's classics, but also an important piece of animation history, as it quickly became the highest grossing non-Disney produced animated feature for its time. It was also one of the first animated films to outdraw a Disney one, beating out The Great Mouse Detective, another traditionally animated film involving mice that was released in 1986, but four months earlier, but by over $22 million. And bear in mind, The Great Mouse Detective is a really damn good movie too, so it should really say something about how big and successful an American Tale really was. It was also a film that, because of its success, guaranteed a future for Dawn and everyone else who worked on the movie. But where does it rank on my listing? Well, as much as I like An American Tale and all that it has to offer, I'm afraid it simply could never be put above The Secret of Nim. Both are great films, but The Secret of Nim speaks to my soul more. The darker concepts, the magic, the science, experiments gone wrong, the unique world it presents, all that good stuff. An American Tale is a great movie with a colorful cast of characters, some great emotional moments, and is a fun time overall, but it simply never comes close to reaching the peaks of The Secret of Nim, at least for me. And so it comfortably ranks as number two for all these reasons. So what comes next? George Lucas and Steven Spielberg present a Don Bluth film, The Land Before Time. Released November 18th of 1988, The Land Before Time is one of the greatest animated films ever created. The Land Before Time takes place during the age of dinosaurs and centers around a young little Apatorosaurus, or long neck, named Littlefoot. Littlefoot and his family, consisting of his mother and his two grandparents, are on a pilgrimage to an oasis known as the Great Valley, where there is said to be plenty of fresh food and water to last generations. And they are on this journey due to the terrible famine going on throughout all the land, making food sparse. Along the journey, Littlefoot ends up meeting Sarah, a young Triceratops, or Threehorn, and learns that Longnecks don't play with three horns, and in fact dinosaurs of one kind never play, work with, or talk with dinosaurs of other kinds. However, despite this, he later tries and plays with Sarah again, but in their bout of fun, they catch the eye of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, or Sharp Tooth, that attacks them both. In the dramatic shuffle, Littlefoot's mom ends up saving them both from the T-Rex all while an earthquake begins splitting the earth in two, separating Sarah from her dad and family, as well as Littlefoot from his grandparents. And to make matters worse, tragically, in the battle, Littlefoot's mother was mortally wounded, 
and dies. This leaves Lilifoot alone and needing to find his way to the Great Valley without the guidance of his mother or anyone. But along the way, other young dinosaurs of all sorts come to befriend him as they make this perilous journey, one of desperation, not just to stave off starvation, death, but also one of self-discovery. This film is a lot darker than an American tale, to say the least, and is without a doubt one of the most emotional of Bluth's films, if not the most emotional. That balance I keep noting is here, but it's done in far greater extremes. Death permeates the film. After Littlefoot's mother dies, he is left all alone, forced to travel the wasteland of the dead, forced to have to deal with the feelings and the reality of death and the loss of a loved one, looking for an oasis so it doesn't starve to death, and escaping the clutches of a beast that means to kill him. Now, annoyingly enough, this movie has been accused by many online before of having a very dark opening and then either pulling its punches after Littlefoot's mother's death, becoming a baby movie not worth watching after this point, or being like Bambi where right after the tragic death, the film then cuts to a bunch of birds and happy music, again pulling its punches. These comments about the film have permeated the internet since the nostalgia critic and have continued on in today with people like YMS, for example. But this is actually false. After Littlefoot's mother dies, we have a scene directly after of him stumbling upon an old dinosaur by the name of Reuter, where at first he's rather grumpy until Reuter comes to understand what happened to the young Longneck's mother. What's going on here? What's your problem? You're not hurt. It's not fair. She should have known better. All whose fault? Mother's. Oh. I see. I see. In this scene, Littlefoot first blames his mother for being reckless and dying. It's all her fault. And then, eventually, this turns into him blaming himself over her death. Why did I wander so far from home? Ruder then consoles Littlefoot. Oh, it's not your fault. <gasps> It's not your mother's fault. It is nobody's fault. The great circle of life has begun. What will I do? I miss her so much. And you'll always miss her, but she'll always be with you, as long as you remember the things she taught you. My tummy hurts. Well, that too will go in time, little fella. Only in time. It's a heart-wrenching yet beautiful moment that I believe perfectly encapsulates grief, especially from the perspective of a child dealing with death. And it's always the part of the movie that pulls at my heart and soul every time I watch it. Now after this, there is a scene where a bunch of little flyers are messing about and fighting over the last cherry in a tree. And while this is a reprieve from the absolute soul-crushing that was going on just a second ago, it's... Also not the end of it either, as by the end of this scene we then see Littlefoot just laying there, being miserable and is unwilling to even eat. We see him wander about and see a shadow he thinks is that of his mother, but is only his own. The movie takes special care to showcase this, and then when Littlefoot does gain the strength to keep going forward, he tries to have Sarah help him, and she rejects him. Once again, leaving him all alone to push forward. The writing in general regarding death, loss, hope, and the general dialogue of the child characters is done perfectly. It's very easy to write a child character in a way that feels too cutesy, or in a way that just makes them feel like adults, but smaller or more annoying. But here in this film, every character feels extremely authentic. This is helped in large part due to the voice cast of children, playing child characters, and notably the voice actress of Ducky, Judith Barcy, who is without a doubt a standout in the film, and who we'll be talking about in more detail very soon. On that note, all the characters from the prideful Sarah, to the sweet and curious Ducky, the Sorolithus or Big Mouth, to the nervous and manic-driven Petrie, the Petrodon or Flyer, to finally Spike, the uh... Very hungry and mentally simple Stegosaurus or Spiketail. The cast is all extremely lovable. 
I especially love the character of Ducky, who is the first other dinosaur to show compassion, to be nice to Littlefoot, to be the one to encourage Petri to fly since he's a flyer and, well, is afraid of heights. She's also the one to help Spike out of his shell, and since Spike's parents are gone, and most likely dead, she takes on the role of a big sister of sorts for him, to give him his name. She's a ray of sunlight in a very dark setting. Sarah, on the other hand, is a very cold and standoffish character, full of pride and is always being a know-it-all. But you see, this is all intentional, as she's basically Asuka from Evangelion, as she uses all this as a defense mechanism since she's actually very scared, lonely, and worried about not being able to see her family again. She was also taught from a very young age that three horns don't play or mess around with other dinosaurs, which takes her the longest to get over, but makes her a very interesting and complex character that goes through the biggest arc of the film, by far for this reason. In another quote from another article from John Cawley, who, by the way, is maybe someone worth talking about in the future video all by themselves because uh, they have an entire website dedicated to a lot of early animation history and is quite the rabbit hole to go down. Quote, During production of An American Tale, talk began of the next feature with Spielberg. Amblin was interested in doing something with dinosaurs, which they saw as a popular topic with children. Again, Spielberg saw animation as mostly a child's medium, much to the disappointment of Don and others. Spielberg's first concept was going to be a film like Bambi, only with dinosaurs. It would tell the story of a young dinosaur growing up in prehistoric times, similar to the dynamics of the Rite of Spring sequence in Disney's Fantasia. In fact, Spielberg envisioned the entire film with no dialogue. From this rough concept, the film grew to include several young dinosaurs. Eventually, it was believed that the film couldn't carry a storyline without dialogue. Don recalled the origin. The Land Before Time was actually a concept before it was a story. Spielberg said, basically, I want to do a soft picture that does not have a real driving plot. It's about five little dinosaurs and how they grow up and work together as a group. We agreed that the Tyrannosaurus Rex would be a great villain. As we talked, we decided it would be more of a pastoral kind of picture. It needs to be symphonic in nature, soft and gentle. Brought on as initial writers were the same team responsible for Tail, Judy Freudberg and Tony Geis. Their script was developed from the ideas of Spielberg and Lucas. However, early in production, it was felt that the storyline was too juvenile and Stu Krieger was brought in to rework the material. Since the script had to be approved by a number of parties in different locations, sections of script were approved at a time rather than a whole. Don remarked that it was like the old days of Disney when segments were developed independently of the finished script. As the storyboarding continued, recalled Don, we came up with another idea, that none of these dinosaurs get along with each other. They all hate each other. They're taught from the time they were born not to associate with each other. That's racism. They're going to have to be untaught the racist idea and learn to like each other and therein lies the triumph of the movie. They will work together to overcome a common goal or enemy. Unlike a lot of youngsters, Don had never been a fan of dinosaurs. I had to do lots and lots of research because I never was a fanatic about dinosaurs as a kid. But in many ways, it became a fictional fantasy because it's about these young children who are taught to hate each other, anyone who is different from him. When they are separated from their parents, these five little children have to learn to get along with each other for survival. So I think there is a bit of a moral in it, too." Unquote. James Horner once again does the soundtrack for this film, and it's quite the sweeping score, full of grandiose, solemn, and imaginative numbers, all tied together with a theme song, If We Hold On Together, written by Horner and Will Jennings and sung by Diana Ross, it being one of the most nostalgic and inspiring tracks to me personally. The full song plays at the very end of the film, but the theme song, the lead motif of it, can consistently be heard throughout the film at key moments, building towards its eventual reveal and tying the musical narrative together. The animation is also yet again top notch, with special care taken to the expressions of the various dinosaurs and creatures seen throughout the film. This includes the fearsome T-Rex, 
the main antagonist of the film, and an ever-present threat throughout it. The black and red-eyed monster isn't a villain of words, though. In fact, unlike the other dinosaurs, Sharptooth says nothing. He is purely a killing machine, looking for a meal. In this way, Sharptooth is very representative of death itself, for all our protagonists, a reminder of their mortality, and if they don't find the Great Valley, if they don't hold on together, and use their unique abilities to help each other out, they will die, if not from starvation, then at the maw of a sharp tooth. On the note of sharp tooth though, quote, Spielberg and Lucas insisted on cutting around 10 minutes of footage from the final film. Animation Magazine reported that one of the principal sections that was cut was a Tyrannosaurus Rex attack sequence. Steven Spielberg and George Lucas apparently felt that it was too frightening and could even cause some psychological damage to very young children. The article went on to state that, in all, 19 scenes were cut, including front-on scenes portraying the children in severe jeopardy and distress. In addition, the children's screams were replaced with milder exclamations. Don fought for the footage, but finally had to give in, making the final running time of the movie only 69 minutes one of the shorter animated features ever produced. Though the studio tried to maintain a pleasant face, the editing session was quite difficult to go through. Over one million dollars of footage was left on the floor by the end of the session. This is when a large number of scenes considered too intense were trimmed. One person involved stated that Don and Spielberg really wanted to make two different movies. Bluth would state that Spielberg didn't have time to look over storyboards and test reels because of the Indiana Jones filming. Spielberg would state he had not been given a chance to see any of the process, which slowed production with them having to make the many changes." Unquote. It's terribly tragic that 10 minutes of animation was taken from this film, and I agree with Don that it should have been left in and I really wish we could have gotten a cut with the literal million dollars worth of animation back intact. Still, even with this glaring issue, it's still a masterpiece all the same. It's a simple story told wonderfully and honestly, and I believe isn't given enough credit for just how good it is these days. Don't get me wrong, it has its fans, but the writing, the dialogue, the animation, the music, Everything in this film comes together perfectly and always leaves me utterly speechless by its end. As a child, it captured my young imagination with this world of dinosaurs. But as an adult, it is an emotionally resonant film that I deeply cherish. But with all that said, where does this film rank? Well, this may or may not be a controversial choice, but I believe that The Land Before Time does indeed beat out The Secret of Nim as the number one ranked film thus far. The Land Before Time is a movie with a strong emotional core, heart, and soul. It speaks to me creatively in similar ways to The Secret of Nim, but in some ways even more so. It's a tale of children forced to take on the dark reality of the world, to find comfort and strength in one another, to lose their innocence in the face of death, and it beautifully shows that famous sentiment Don Bluth had towards his films perfectly. That these films were for everyone, and that you can show a child all the darkness of the world so long as it has a happy ending. It's a movie that is endlessly inspiring to me, and will never cease to have me shed at least a tear by its end, and will remain in the recesses of my heart for as long as I shall live. I can perfectly understand why The Secret of Nim is considered so many people's favorites, and perhaps creatively, it is Don Bluth's magnum opus as far as his own independent ideas all coming together, without the restrictions or people getting in the way of his true vision. But even still, The Lamb Before Time beats it out by quite a bit, in my opinion. But with all that being said, what film comes next? Well, One of Bluth's main beliefs is that animation is not just for children. And if adults would take a cue from the kids, they might rediscover a childhood joy. I have a theory 
that the child in people really doesn't ever die. Some people manage to strangle it a little while, but you can bring it back out. Though creating an animated film is sometimes tedious work, Bluth feels it is well worth it, particularly when one scene can have an impact for a lifetime. It creates a memory having your parents sitting next to you that you will never forget. And later on, when you become a parent, you'll take your children and go back to see that same film. Goodbye, Charlie. I love you. Released November 17th of 1989, All Dogs Go to Heaven is one of the most misrepresented and strangely contentious entries in this whole catalog. All Dogs Go to Heaven takes place in New Orleans, 1939, and follows the story of Charlie B. Barkin, a German Shepherd who escapes the dog pound with his friend Itchy Itchford, both escaping death in the process. They then return to their casino riverboat on the bayou, formerly run by Charlie himself and his business partner, Carface Carthers. However, in his absence, Carface has grown more attached to his power and money, and is reluctant to share the profits with Charlie again. And in fact, it was actually Carface that was the one responsible for secretly selling Charlie out to the pound to begin with. Thus, Carface persuades Charlie to leave town, with half of the casino's earnings. Charlie agrees, but is later intoxicated during Mardi Gras, and is then subsequently killed by a car being pushed down a hill by Carface, with the assistance of his uh, assistant, Killer. And thus, Charlie dies. But because he's a dog, Charlie is automatically sent to heaven. Even if in life he wasn't known for really many good deeds, and in fact he was a pretty bad guy generally speaking, an angel then explains to him that because dogs are inherently good and loyal, all dogs go to heaven and are entitled to paradise. However, this place just isn't exactly Charlie's scene. Everything is so lovely here, so planned, so ordered, and that's what's driving me crazy. So he cheats death by stealing a gold pocket watch, which represents his life, and by winding it back up, he's able to go back to Earth. However, in doing this, he can never return to heaven. And should the watch ever stop turning, he will die and go to hell instead. However, if the watch continues to run, then he will be immortal on Earth. After Charlie returns to Earth, he plans on getting revenge on Carface for killing him. In the pursuit of this goal, Charlie and Itchy then find out the key to Carface's current success, with betting is the young orphan girl named Anne-Marie, who is kidnapped and keeps held captive for her ability to talk to animals, which proves helpful when betting on races with rats. Charlie rescues her and promises to feed the poor and help her find a family using her gift. But, uh, well, Charlie isn't really a good boy. So, what he really wants to use her gift for is just to be more successful than Carface and to build himself a brand new casino. Lots of drama and shenanigans ensue. Conceptually, I find this film extremely interesting, and there's a lot to chew on right from the get-go. It once again has that balance as it's a movie about talking dogs and fun shenanigans that they get into, but it's also a film about the Mafia at the same time, where the main character dies after getting drunk off his ass, and then hates the goody-two-shoes nature of heaven so much that he goes back down to Earth for the expressed purpose of getting revenge on the bastard who just killed him. It's charming, dark, but is also full of heart as the film goes on. Now something to note about the history of this movie and its development is Bluth's previous film, The Lamb for a Time, once again went up against the Disney film of that time, that being Oliver and Company, and beat it out at the box office yet again. But clearly there was some issues afoot behind the scenes. Don Bluth no longer wanted to work under the restrictions of Steven Spielberg and George Lucas perhaps being afraid of history repeating itself, where he would constantly be at the demands of others' censorship, like back at Disney. Plus, I do believe, even though Land for Time is such an amazing movie, that Steven Spielberg and George Lucas did objectively make it worse by cutting out 10 whole minutes of animation from it, for the sake of it not scaring the kids too much. It's also a bit funny, considering that one of Steven Spielberg's most famous films he would ever create 
Jurassic Park, that also largely appealed to children, was also about dinosaurs, except you actually see them mauling and tearing people apart in that movie, so I guess he changed his mind sometime between then to then. But nonetheless, this made Bluth very cautious going forward, and so he would end up making a rather risky decision, and chose to walk away from Amblem Animation. During the production of their previous feature film, Sullivan Bluth Studios had moved to Van Nuys, California, to a state-of-the-art studio facility in Dublin, Ireland. And once Don left Amblin and all their funding behind, new funding was secured from UK-based Goldcrest Films in a $70 million deal to produce three animated feature films, All Dogs Go to Heaven being the first of these. According to, once again, an article written by John Colley, quote, The premise for Dogs goes back to the time of post-NIM problems. One of the projects Don was developing was a film consisting of three short stories. One tale was satire of detective films with a mangy German Shepherd as a private eye. The dog was designed specifically for Burt Reynolds. Burt was a friend of Dom DeLuise, who had worked so well with Don on Nim. There was some general talks and Don put together a rough board on the project. It never went into full production, and the games came along, temporarily pushing all features into a hold pattern. While working on the original project, the studio adopted a stray shepherd mix, who was dubbed Bert. This quiet mutt stayed in the studio for years, and eventually went to Ireland with them. Initially, they wanted to give Bert the dog credit and tail, but one of the production assistants objected when they discovered the dog would receive as much credit as she would. With total control over his next picture, Don and his team looked carefully for a property. In 1988, The Hollywood Reporter stated that the company's choice of subject matter for its next project, Sullivan explained, was inspired by the fact that the top three animated films of all time at the time were about dogs. The Fox and the Hound, 101 Dalmatians, and The Lady and the Tramp. The logical choice was the Burt Reynolds dog story. They christened it, All Dogs Go to Heaven, based on a title of a book that a teacher read to Don's fourth grade class. Don, John, and Gary began shaping the story in November of 1987. John Pomeroy recalled some of the early story discussions in an interview released before the film's debut. Our early story meetings were spent trying to describe what kind of tale this title would be about. To backtrack, we were searching for a concept which would hook an audience. We've done dinosaurs, which is enough to grab younger people. We've done immigrant mice arriving at the Statue of Liberty. That's a provocative subject. Don's title, All Dogs Go to Heaven, had a built-in attraction, heaven, with all the mystique and mysteriousness attached to it, and the idea that there might be somewhere out there in the cosmos where dogs go after they die. However, from the start, the title seems to have been a sore point with some, after the announcement, some media commentators began to make light of it. One animation writer stated, Titles like that is why most people say, All animation goes to hell. There were various times in the press the film seemed to be searching for a new name. Charlie the Heavenly Dog was mentioned as the new title in November of 1988. However, Donna's crew continually stated that the original title would be the title the film would be released under. Many people suggested changing the title, stated Don in an interview prior to the film's release. I thought, no, 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 no. All Dogs Go to Heaven is very provocative. When I would mention that title to people, they would grin. Whether or not you believe in heaven or an afterlife, it's still just a little fairy tale. An allegory which says, if you're ever going to come of age, you have earned it. The original story was finalized by Don, John, and Gary. All great stories seem to me to have two things in common, stated Don. They entertain and they educate. I've always loved the experience of being carried away in fantasy, but I think it's important to learn something while you're there. Gary Goldman recalled it took some time to decide where to set the film. Eventually, he recalled, we opted for New Orleans as a completely different setting than anything we'd ever used before, with overtones of Mardi Gras, jazz music, and Mississippi and a feeling of worldliness that contrasted nicely with the film's spiritual theme. Along with co-director Dan Kunster, I made a special trip there and we took more than 3,000 photos for research purposes. 
Once the preliminary work was done, the studio had devised a story based on elements from such films as It's a Wonderful Life, Little Miss Marker, and A Guy Named Joe, later remade as Heaven Can Wait. David West was then brought in to put all these situations into a final screenplay." Unquote. So bearing all that in mind, this film is undoubtedly, like The Secret of Nim, a film that was very much close to Don's heart, and something that he wanted to have told, that he believed in. So what was the final result of this? Well, in my opinion, it is yet another absolute masterpiece, but maybe with a few flaws. I do want to get this out of the way right off the bat. This film is a musical, and some of the musical numbers are better than others. You Can't Keep a Good Dog Down probably being my personal favorite song in the film. You can't keep a good dog down. No, no, you no, can't. no. You can't keep a good dog down. But tragically, this film's reputation has been permanently marred online by one of its musical numbers, or at least it was for a time, I should say. One that is sung by a big-lipped alligator. Let's make music together. Let's make sweet harmony. Oh. Now, in the context of this film, this is just yet another musical number. But from the context of the internet, it is, well, a meme. A meme created primarily by the Nostalgia Chick and pretty much most popularized by the Nostalgia Critic. Now, I already kind of ranted and raved about this once before in my Nostalgia Critic video, so allow me to just quickly put a clip up from that video to uh, catch you all up to speed. It's a big lift alligator moment. What's a big lift alligator moment? A big lift alligator moment. Well, I mean, that's not an alligator. It's a. Uh, that's not an alligator. You stupid sack of shit. Perhaps you don't remember the big lift alligator scene from All Dogs Go to Heaven. This is named after the random musical number sung by a big-lipped alligator towards the end of the film. A scene that comes right the fuck out of nowhere, has little to no bearing whatsoever on the plot, is way over the top in terms of ridiculousness, even within the context of the movie. And after it happens, no one ever speaks of it again. Oh, like the dancing fire gang from Labyrinth, the pink elephants from Dumbo, the creepy-ass tunnel scene from Willy Wonka. That's right. And now this festering pile of pointlessness. Yes, Critic, you're learning a lot today. I am. I really am. I hate everything about this. This big-lipped alligator moment comment would end up becoming a meme used not only by the critic and the girl critic, but pretty much everyone else on the site, and it even went beyond it and then on to general YouTube. This comment, this criticism, is created around the premise that this big-lipped alligator comes in, sings a song in the movie, and then is never brought up or important again. Thus, a big-lipped alligator moment is a pointless scene. And while you could argue that this scene is a bit random in that place in the movie, Hell, there is a few elements of that movie that are a bit random and maybe didn't need to have a musical number. Of the big-lipped alligator, you know, the one that's not supposed to show up and is never seen again in said movie, you know that one, the big-lipped alligator? Well, <laughs> what if I told you that, that the fucking big-lipped alligator does come back? Now, wouldn't that be the weirdest, wildest fucking thing ever? An ongoing joke that went on for fucking years was based on a fucking lie? Well, there he is. He comes back in the movie. Oh, and hey, he's directly important to the finale fight of the film, coming in to help our protagonist against the antagonist. Almost as if his inclusion wasn't RANDOM?! I have been sitting with this for years at this point. And while All Dogs Go to Heaven might not be the perfect movie, it is a damn good one that has gotten way, way too much shit over the years. Mostly by people who have never, ever watched the movie because the only thing they knew about it was that it was the movie with the big-lipped fucking alligator moment! <clears throat> <clears throat> I apologize, 
for my outburst. I just can't stand it when lies are perpetrated for years. It, it hurts my very soul. Now, it was actually the Nostalgia Chick, a girl feminist political twist on the Nostalgia Critic character, that came up with this meme, though it kinda would be used by almost everyone on the website, in which anytime there is a super random moment in a movie, such as a musical number, a trippy sequence, or a moment that seems to be kind of out of place, etc., it was a bit of a flexible meme to be fair, they would call it a big-lipped alligator moment, in reference to the big-lipped alligator that sings a song in this movie. Sadly, this colored a lot of people's opinions on this movie as a sort of random, nonsensical trash fire. It's why in the year of our Lord 2023, I have to actually make reference to this point because it was so prominent at the time that if I didn't mention the big-lipped alligator moment thing, somebody in the comments surely would. But on a more important note, the premise, the idea that this movie is nonsensical, couldn't be further from the truth. Especially when it comes to this film's characters, setting, and the way that everything's presented beautifully through this film's animation. On that note, the animation in this film is, as always, quite stellar. The characters are exceptionally expressive, and personally, I really like the old-timey New Orleans atmosphere that this film constantly exudes. There's a real coziness to it that I think was difficult to get across in the past three movies, with the characters constantly being in danger and in very grim places, not that that's a bad thing, mind you, uh, it's in fact a really cool thing, uh, but by comparison, this movie is a lot more laid back. I especially love this scene where Charlie and the gang are in this little car that they've made into like a home slash bed, and he's reading a bedtime story that he's literally making up on the spot to Anne Marie. It's these three characters that are the heart and soul of the movie, and Charlie being the protagonist in particular is quite interesting. Before now, we've had a scared but strong and determined mother trying to save her children, a little mouse boy trying to find his family and grow into his own, and a baby dinosaur trying to follow his dead mother's words and survive this wretched world and come into his own as a leader and a protector of his new friends. Here, the main character is just kind of an asshole. I mean, he is a lovable asshole, but when Carface, the bad guy of the film, is only slightly more of a piece of shit than the protagonist, then you know you have an interesting dynamic. Carface kidnapped Anne-Marie to exploit her gift of speaking to animals to make money. When Charlie finds her, he pretends to be saving her, but in actuality, he is also just exploiting her gift nearly the exact same way. However, unlike Carface, who is steadfast in his pursuit of power and money, Charlie does have some good in him, and as he grows closer and comes to understand Anne-Marie, he feels all the worse using her as he has done. And by film's end, it is of course a complete arc where this extremely selfish character commits a completely selfless act in the pursuit of saving the life of Anne-Marie. Every main character in these films has gone through an arc, Miss Brisby finding the courage to walk through hell on earth to find her children, eventually harnessing that power through a literal, magical, spiritual sense. Fievel growing up and finding himself along with finding his own parents, finally being able to fit into that hat that his father gave him snugly when it once fell over his head before. Littlefoot finding the strength to carry on in spite of the trauma that he has endured and become a leader, an inspirational figure to his friends and overcome the literal embodiment of death. And Charlie? Well, he's a dog. So it was always in the cards for him to go to heaven, despite him being a bad dog throughout all his life. But by the film's end, he becomes a dog that's earned his way to heaven. Someone who is willing to sacrifice his life for the sake of another. And I think that that is genuinely beautiful. The other characters are good as well, mind you. Ishi being the faithful companion and best bud of Charlie. While he is sometimes the uh, comic relief of the movie, he is also the character that helps ground Charlie a lot throughout the movie, with him really being happy with Charlie just being alive, and would legitimately be satisfied if the two of them just got out of this whole business of scams and schemes 
and enjoy the second chance they've been given. Also, on a random note about Itchy, and kind of related back to the thatguyoftheglasses.com shit, I swear I remember content creator Marsgirl stating at one point that she has or had a crush on fucking Itchy the Wiener Dog. And that weird factoid stuck with me for years after. Anytime I looked at Itchy, at some point I would think back to the fact that Mars Girl thought that he was hot. I think, man, what a weird and silly thing to say, you know? Bish wants to fuck a dog. But then when I went to go get footage for this exact quote for this video, I found that I could not find her saying this anywhere in her review of the film which I thought was for sure was where she said it. Maybe she could have said it on someone else's video, since collabs on that site were always very frequent back then. Maybe she said it in one of her podcasts or something, since she had some of those over the years, and I kind of watched all the content on the website, so I did watch some of those. Or maybe it was in her original All Dogs Go to Heaven video, but since she had to cut a bunch of shit out of that video, for copyright reasons for it to be on YouTube, maybe she also decided to cut that part out of her saying that too, since she could have been embarrassed or thought it was cringe or something to say years later? Or maybe I'm just fucking going crazy, or I've entered an alternate universe where the only difference is, is if Mars Girl said this weirdly specific thing or not. I don't know, but uh, moving on, I suppose. She is, uh, pretty cool, all the same. Carface, while a simple mafia boss type villain, is still fun in how wicked and cruel he is, especially to his second in command, Killer. He's certainly no complex character, mind you, but he is a fun one all the same. And Marie, while not the most complex character either, does bring in a decent amount of innocence into the movie. In a world of mafia dogs, she's just a little girl looking for a place to call home to have some loving parents to take care of her. She thinks of others before herself, and is only convinced to help Charlie in his schemes because he lies to her that the money will be going towards helping others in need. However, what really sells her character so well is her voice actress, Judith Barzi. As I noted before, Judith also played Ducky in The Land Before Time, and she gave an exceptional performance there too. What is your name? Maybe you cannot talk yet, huh? Huh? Don't you know anything? Long necks don't talk to... Or whatever you are. Alright. I am not a long neck. I am a big mouth. I lost my family in the big earth shake. You want to go with me? Yes! Oh, okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. My name's Littlefoot. <laughs> Mine is Ducky. Yep, that is what it is. Yep, yep, yep. Like this story, Mr. Itchy? You would. Then what happens? Well, more. Was she pretty? Ha <laughs> ha, she was to die for. Horses? <laughs> now look what you've done. Judith brought a wonderful childlike wonder and sense of optimism through her performance in both of these films. She really sells the emotions at play. Of course, this is where I feel I must briefly discuss something outside the movie. Because you see, Judith Barzi was only 10 years old when she played the part of Anne Marie, and this would be the last film that she ever acted in. Because Judith's father, Joseph, an alcoholic who had a history of threatening to end himself as well as his wife and daughter, and who was physically abusive to his family, even when he wasn't drinking, would horrifically bring her life to an end. Tragically, on July 28th of 1988, this would all but come to its terrible conclusion when Joseph killed his wife Maria and his own daughter Judith, and then himself. This act of pure evil sent shockwaves and is something that makes All Dogs Go to Heaven extra emotional knowing that it features the last performance of such a talented and sweet girl who had her life ripped away from her by an absolute fucking monster. Both The Lamb Before Time and All Dogs Go to Heaven were released after Judith's passing. This obviously affected the crew and Don himself in the production of All Dogs Go to Heaven in particular. In the final song of the movie, for the closing credits, Love Survives is dedicated to her memory. 
This makes what is already a absolutely beautiful and heart-wrenching final scene of this film all the more soul-crushing. As Charlie comes in from hell, the devil himself washing over him after he had sacrificed himself for Anne-Marie's sake. But then an angel comes in and strikes right through the devil and tells Charlie that he's able to go back to heaven now since he sacrificed his life for hers and that he's able to say his final goodbye to her. On that note, this film may not be perfect. It totally can be a bit strange at times. Going between a song about the value of sharing with each other, which is kind of my least favorite song in the movie, to these crazy moments where Charlie is having a vision of going to hell with this amazing rotoscoping and these crazy ass devil and demon designs, with like the devil himself appearing as this dragon of sorts, is by far one of the best moments in the movie, visually speaking. You have this story about dog gangsters bumping each other off and escaping death. It can be a little bit weird in places because of that. But it's also a film with a lot of high concepts. Be it how heaven works in the movie, the concept of everyone having their own life clock that can be winded back up to go back to Earth for the price of their mission to heaven, strong character moments, and in general, I feel like, again, this movie's sillier moments seem to be overemphasized by people. Almost as if they forget that a good chunk of the secret of Nim is the crow fucking around with string and being a big silly doofus. Even in Dawn's darker and more high concept films, there is going to be some whimsy and silliness. Including, yes, perhaps a song number by a big-lipped alligator. And I personally enjoy all these aspects of the film. But I do think that the parts of the movie that should be more emphasized now are the genuine heart that it has and the wonderfully written characters, particularly that of Charlie. It's a wonderful classic of a film that I connect with deeply and should without a shadow of a doubt be considered one of the greats of his time. And for all these reasons and more, I personally rank All Dogs Go to Heaven in third place, just below The Secret of Nim and the Lamb for Time, but above An American Tale which some may find controversial. Not that I have anything against an American tale, mind you, it's a really damn good movie. But I personally just like the character writing and the themes and overall message of All Dogs Go to Heaven more. And it's definitely a classic that you should not skip out on. In 1990, for Don Bluth's All Dogs Go to Heaven, a new chapter of home video history is about to be written. MGM UA Home Video and Downey join forces again on Don Bluth's animated motion picture hit, All Dogs Go to Heaven, with a promotional campaign valued at more than $21 million. That's over two and a half times the value of the Wizard of Oz tie-in, which guarantees that All Dogs Go to Heaven will be an even greater success. Uncle Itchy. What, Little Scratch? Can we get a video with a dog in it like that one with Toto and the Witch? Oh, Little Scratch, you already have the Wizard of Oz. Well, how about that one with you and Uncle Charlie? The one with all those dogs? Oh, you mean all dogs go to heaven. Look, Uncle Itchy, there it is. Can we get it? Sure, it's available on video cassette and laser disc too. Well, how much is it? Can we get it? Can we get it? Hey, calm down, calm down. <laughs> the video cassette is only $19.98 after $5 downy rebate. Now, here's the thing. Before now, Don Bluth's story has been one of mostly accomplishments, with two of his films not only being huge financial successes and making a name for himself and those who work with him, but both An American Tale and The Land Before Time also beat out the Disney film that it went up against at that time. This made for quite the statement on not only the work of Don Bluth, but also of that of Disney's and the general state of the animation industry at that point in time. Don Bluth and all those who left Disney pushed for more creative freedom and the ability to tell more mature stories, and were swiftly denied. Thus, when they left to go do stuff on their own and they beat out Disney so handily, it proved they knew what they were talking about and that audiences agreed with them, and that those that stayed behind should have listened, and well, they might not have listened then, but they certainly were now. Because you see, All Dogs Go to Heaven was, like the previous two films Don had directed, released on the exact same day as the accompanying Disney film of the year. 
This was Don's way of fighting back. Some may call it a bit spiteful, some may see it as an indie artist confidently fighting the likes of a media giant, a real David and Goliath sort of situation. But either way, it had worked in the past for Don, but not this time. Because you see, the film that All Dogs Go to Heaven went against, and was thus compared to that year, was The Little Mermaid. You know, this little well-known movie that started the fucking Disney renaissance and lifted the company up higher than perhaps they had ever been seen before and uh, started the chain reaction that would lead to such timeless classics as Beauty and the Beast, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and The Lion King. Disney herds Don Warcry and they suffered two solid blows, but maybe in retrospect, Don had beaten them a bit too well for his own sake, because sadly for Don, this is where his directing career would enter what many consider his Dark Age, or perhaps more charitably, his Silver Age. He would not have a box office hit for years, up until Anastasia, and from here it would become one issue after the next involving pretty much all the movies he's directing going forward. People immediately compared All Dogs Go to Heaven to The Little Mermaid, and thus whatever flaws it had was exasperated, and it became a competition for which animated film people were taking their family to see. Some also thought that the plot was perhaps morbid, with it being about a dogs that die and stuff, which many also people thought was going to be a sad movie and they didn't want to bring their kids to a sad movie. Little Mermaid was the sure bet. Still, bearing all that in mind, All Dogs Go to Heaven still made at least 27 million at the box office. So it wasn't a bomb, but it was clearly swept away by The Little Mermaid, and it made only half of what his past two films had made. Similar to The Secret of Nim, however, All Dogs Go to Heaven did end up becoming a sleeper hit though, due to its home video release. A strong promotional campaign helped it to become one of the top selling VHSs at the time selling over 3 million copies in its first month, which is why I think it's often considered a cult classic, and at least did end up becoming successful by story's end. However, even still, box office wise, and perhaps if you could uh, allow me to be so esoteric, symbolically, it had lost quite handily and clearly to Disney. It's ironic in a way. Don left Disney because he loved animation. He had dedicated his entire life to animation, Hell, the man had been drawing cartoons since he was just a little boy, and he wanted to push it to be the art that at once inspired him, and that he would hope would in turn inspire a whole new generation of children to do the same. He fought hard for the animation industry to not die and perish in the land of mediocrity, and in a cruel way, he did just that by pushing his enemy to create some of the greatest pieces of animated art that the world had ever seen. He had saved the animation industry in his own way, but at the price of him no longer being a part of it. But this story certainly isn't done yet. He still had a career of films ahead of him, and he could still make animated movies and go against Disney again. But sadly, we all know how historically this story plays out. So from here, we have officially entered the dark age of Bluth's films. While everything else was Kino, this is now the questionable era. But even still, could some of these movies perhaps be overlooked? Perhaps even some of them are overhated, misunderstood. Hell, maybe even one or two of them are actually pretty good, maybe. And where would I personally rank these films amongst his catalog? Well, there's a lot of history to go over, so let's find out together. And that is it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so very much for watching through this whole video. This series of Don Bluth videos is kind of one that I've wanted to do for years now, so it's very cathartic to finally be able to start doing them and to be able to share my thoughts and feelings and tell the story of Don Bluth the way that I've always wanted to. Obviously, this is only part one of what will end up being a three-part series, and the second part will cover the next four films, The Dark Age, as I alluded to earlier. So I do hope that you're all looking forward to that. And of course, if you have any thoughts about any of the films that I've covered thus far, or that I am going to cover during this retrospective, please feel free to share your thoughts down below and 
let me know. And where would you personally rank these first four films amongst each other? I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of my loyal patrons and channel members, including all of my night eggs and my night outlets, as well as a very special thank you to all of my great night owls, including EB Agent J, Sharif, Channel 11, Hex Maniac Hanna, Tony Teramaya, Icy Dice, Pohot, Medusa's Hex, and Tyler the Leper, as well as a super duper special thank you to all of my Arch Owls, including the Fearless Forgotten Ace, the Super Saiyan Sword, the other Super Saiyan Star Punch Gaming, the Savory Salt, the Wise Nicodemus, the very talented Cherry NGT, and the Gucci Vibe Zen Garden Party. Thank you all so very much for watching this, and if you happen to catch it, there will be a live Q&A going up in a few hours. For any questions regarding this video, the series, or just in general to my channel and upcoming content. So I hope to see some of you there. But until next time, this has been Dylan the Night Owl, flying off.